well, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I've you, I've gotten out of Houston, but it's a little hard to get Houston out of me. I've been, I was born in downtown and lived most of my 58 years here, and um, I love this city, and I'm still in awe of the city, and I still hate the traffic. And I, <laughs> but Waco is a little different than that. They have a thing in Waco. If you live in Waco, do you know the three best, best places to go eat? Austin, Dallas, and Houston. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> Wanna, um, but God's in Waco too. Well, there's. Uh, I want to bring you greetings from uh, George W. Truett Theological Seminary, number one seminary in the Big Twelve, and uh, we we are proud of that. Unchallenged so far. It's kind of amazing. One day I'm in the trenches, struggling as a pastor, still after 22 years in one place, trying to figure out what I'm doing and what it means and how to do it better and how not to be done in by it and how to make the best contribution to the kingdom. And next day I'm a professor of pastoral ministry, and all of a sudden I'm an expert on it. You know, uh, there aren't any experts on this. There are just practitioners. And uh, so, um, in one way, I I was I was reading a study uh, for one of my classes I was teaching, a study about people who leave ministry, and it was done by the Lilly, uh, sponsored by the Lilly Foundation, I think it's called Pew and Pulpit, one of their studies they do at Duke University, and they've done an extensive study about why pastors leave ministry, and uh, they had a category in there that I, I really resented, I reacted to pretty strongly, it was this category of people who, they called it leaving the ministry, but they went to do something like I just done. Now, it doesn't feel like leaving the ministry. It feels like I'm still having pastoral conversations with people regularly during the week. I'm still studying scriptures and praying. I'm still preaching every time I get a chance. It doesn't feel like I've left the ministry. Uh, but I do understand I'm not in the trenches in the same way that you are and I was. And uh, to tell you the truth, it really does look a little bit different from the pew than from the pulpit. And so when Tom asked me to reflect on that a little bit, the first thing I did was uh, sit down and sort of scratch out the first set of ideas that came forward about what would I say about what have I learned by looking at pastoral ministry in the rearview mirror. Um, and then I've just gone back over the weeks and looked at that list again, edited and scratched out things and added things to it and all that. But right after I had started the list, um, I got my latest issue of Leadership Journal, which I still subscribe to. And uh, there was an article in there by a guy named Jack Connell. He served 20 years as a pastor and then left to join Northeastern Seminary at Roberts Wesleyan College to serve as vice president and to teach pastoral ministry. Pretty much the same move that I'd made. And he had written an article called Ministry Mulligans, which was, uh, I thought, well, that's clever. I could steal that, <laughs> but uh, I'm not. Uh, but it was the same sort of thing. He had just done a little bit of reflection on what he would do different if he had to take the shot over again. And I'll just share you his things real quickly. There, there's just four. He said he would give himself to more collaboration and less competition. That's with other pastors, particularly in the area where he was served. More collaboration, less competition. I'd second that motion. Um, he said he'd do more pastor and less CEO. And I've got had something like that on my list already. More ru uh, rest and less rush. That was already on my list. And more friendship and less isolation. And that was on my list. So I felt after reading his, I thought, well, at least that resonates with some of the stuff I was thinking about. So I've, I've made a list of 10 things I think I've learned so far um, about pastoral ministry through the rearview mirror. So these are some of those things. I thought maybe I could mention these. I don't mind if you just want to interrupt and talk about one of them right in the middle of it or if you want to wait till all 10 of them, then we can talk about ones that interest you. Yesterday I was out at HBU to make a presentation to a class about seminary and I had a whole bunch of goodies with me that, you know, they kind of marketing stuff, people have pens and stuff like that. And, and to get students to ask questions from me, I would just, I would have to, throw, it's like throwing fish to the seals, you know. It's like, okay, if you ask a question, I've got a journal here. So somebody ask a question. So I don't have any goodies today. So you're just going to, I'm going to trust you. I can't feed the seals today. But it was very, I had this image, you're just tossing fish out to the, okay. Um, and these are in no particular order, but they are just the, my own reflections about that. One of the things I think I've learned is that community is not to be taken for granted. And this was something, uh, this was thing that my wife and I were probably most naive about in making a move from one, being in one place 22 years to moving to another place. Um, I did not have a clue about how challenging it is to form new community and new friendship. When you're a pastor or church staff member, 
you don't really have trouble, generally, unless you got bad breath, about having people around you. They, they tend to gather around you. Before long, you've got acquaintances and friends, and you may be blessed to have some very close friends. And if you stay in one place for uh, multiple decades, uh, you have some very dear friends that you've shared life with and uh, raised children with. As we had announced our departure, uh, Melinda and I, uh, we, had a, we were part of a small group that met on Sunday nights, and one of our friends in that group said, and Clear Lake, where we were, is not a place where people generally retire to. They work their whole career and then they move somewhere. So it just, if we had stayed there, it was just a matter of time all our friends would have moved away. It's just going to happen there. So we were reflecting on this in a small group, and one of our friends said, you know, it just dawns on me that never again in my life will I have a group of friends who know my adult children. You know, if I mention Taylor to Tom, He's got a whole story there, and so because Taylor was the son that we were wrestling that, that those days. And so when I told him that today that he's now uh, going to go to, he's in the Army, he's a staff sergeant, and he's applying for some special training, and when I told that to Tom, that means something because he knows this whole story. Now, if I tell that to my friends in Waco, they go, well, that's not, they, they don't have, it's not ever going to be there again. So you have this community, and I, I didn't realize what a struggle it was going to be to find that in a fresh way. We found my daughter and my wife and I found ourselves several times sitting around, you know, the first semester we had moved there, which was a year ago, um, you know, in the middle of the week, staring at the three of us, staring at each other, going, what y'all want to do? <laughs> There's nobody to call and say, let's go get coffee or anything like that. Well, what I learned from that is, one, you don't replace 20 years of friendships in a year anyway. That doesn't make any sense. But what, our peop what people are up against when they move into our communities and come to our churches is they're up against friendly people who have already formed their groups. And as friendly as they are on Sunday morning, incorporating them into life is another thing altogether. And it's a challenging thing. We go to church. Now our lifestyle doesn't really lead to f fixing this very easily. I mean, we're, I'm an interim pastor at a church, so I'm there on Sundays and not during the week. So... And that means I'm out of my church that we attend in Waco on a regular basis. Uh, so we're going to have to figure out how to solve that problem. But that's, that's been one of the things. I, but I put myself in the place of lay people who come to, I'm picturing the church I was pastor of, who move from across the country and leave friends and family behind, and they're brand new here, and people are friendly to them on Sunday morning, shake their hands and do all that sort of stuff. But who reaches out and incorporates them and say, let's go get coffee, let's go get lunch, I want to get to know you, tell me about your kids. I, I, I got to have a suspicion that doesn't happen so easy for people. And, um, Did you have an assimilation group to assimilate people? In the well, they, you know, assimilation was in our church was kind of defined in terms of getting them into a small group, a Sunday school class or something. But, I mean, the actual real assimilation of people who have their radar up and go, that couple's new, and I know what they're up against, but when they've been there for 20 years themselves, they don't remember what they're up against. And it takes, uh, it takes some effort. And uh, it's, a, it's not a wonder to me that people don't stick any more than they do in church sometimes. I just, I mean, to turn the fire up on that, volume up on that a whole lot in terms of these are new people. What's it going to take for them to find home here? Yeah. And I've sort of... We all struggle with that. Yeah. When you get new people in, you, you try to put them with somebody, but they have, they have friends and associates. They're not, not, they're not unfriendly, they just, don't, they just don't see what's necessary to help pull them in. And how, at any rate, that, that's on my list. It's got to be intentional. It does. And uh, so it's just amazing to me how much of the effort is dependent upon the new person. And if they're not willing to put that effort in, how quickly they could get marginalized. And uh, so that, that was one of the things I, uh, when people ask me a lot, what do you miss about uh, the pastor, what do you miss about uh, about the where you were? It's just people. I mean, that's who I miss. Uh, one of those tight friends in our life, um, one whose wife said that about nobody's gonna know our kids again. A couple of weeks ago, Super Bowl Sunday, they knew we probably weren't too interested in that Super Bowl, and they weren't. And they called us on Sunday afternoon, and said, "You want to meet in College Station for coffee and dinner?" So we said, "Sure." So we drove halfway and met, and um, and that was a you know. That was the kind of relationship we had with those folks, and um, but we'll, we'll get there. But I just how hard it is, just thinking about the outsider coming in. That's one of the things that do for me. 
Uh, again, these are in no order. One of the things I'm pretty convinced about more than I was even maybe as, I, as a pastor is that the work you do on preaching is time well spent. It's worth doing the work to preach well. And I'm telling you that as somebody who last year, after having preached three times every weekend for 45, 50 weeks a year for 22 years, preached eight times last year. And so I listened to a lot more sermons last year. I happen to be blessed with an incredibly good pastor. Josh Carn, we go to University Baptist Church in Waco now. We have never actually moved our membership from UBC here because they don't do membership at UBC Waco, so we don't have any place to move it to. You just participate. It's mostly college students. If they did membership, they'd have to have two full-time staff members just to handle this, you know, 25% of your membership coming and going every year as freshmen come in and uh, seniors go out. And so we're, the, we're by far in the old people in the church. I mean, the, uh, by far. My wife and I, there's about four couples in the church that have gray hair, you know, that's about it. Um, but our pastor is the age of my middle son, Josh Carney. Josh is a Truett graduate and um, bright guy, good communicator, uh, always has something good to say. And I, I just can't tell you how much it means to me to go to church and know my pastor is going to have something to say. Yeah. And he's going to be passionate about it. And he's, he's studied it. And he's not going to be, you know, shooting from the hip. And uh, that means a lot to me yeah. as a listener. We had a retired pastor in our church in uh, Clear Lake when I was first there. He passed away after a while. Uh, Merle Mitchell, a really delightful man, pastored in Missouri for many, many years. But he would come to church and he'd be in his wheelchair and sitting in the back and uh, he would give me pastoral advice every once in a while. And one of the things he told me several times is, remember Robert, it takes longer to listen to a sermon than it does to preach one. <laughs> and I, so, <laughs> so I kind of filed that away. but. I would say, I mean, one of the things I'm more convinced of than ever is the work you do on preaching is time well spent. Do it really the best. Use the gifts and time and abilities and training God's given you because the people who show up in the pew value that. And um, I, I've been blessed not to have to listen to a poor sermon in the last year, except the ones lately that in McKinney. They're, they're lacking a little bit, <laughs> but I'm working on that. Uh, third thing that um, I, I wrote down was, and this is sort of like uh, Jack Connell's uh, More Rest, Less Rush, is I've learned that there are saner ways of living life than the intensity of a busy pastoral ministry. And that much of the way I was carrying out my calling was unsustainable. And that, I mean, you can't keep it up that way forever. And that to find sustainability in ministry and be able to do something over a long period of time requires huge injections of sanity into our lifestyle. Um, Eugene Peterson reminds me in several of his books, he uses the word, he says the word busy as an adjective to describe the word pastor should sound to our ears like the word adulterous to describe a spouse or embezzling to describe a banker. <laughs> that busy pastor should be an offensive expression to us. Yeah. Now you get the mail in the mail that's addressed to, you know, this conference for the busy pastor, you know, the busy pastor, the busy pastor. And then how do people, what do people walk up to you to, they want to talk to you and what do they say first? I know you're busy. I know you're busy. That's right. And I, I, I told them no, I'm productive. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have actually, I told the congregation about this, uh, you know, the, the Peterson's quotation and uh, I said, please don't, you know, tell me I'm busy. This is what I do. I talk to people. I, I listen to your life. I, you know, don't, and they do it. Students do the same thing. Dr. Creech, I know you're busy, but no, 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 no. I'm not busy. I'm not busy because it <laughs> sounds offensive. Martin Marty had a similar thing. He wrote in a column in Christian Century. He said that the busy, busy should be a horrible word to a pastor. It, busy implies I don't have time for you. There's no space in my life for you. Uh, I, I've got more important things to do than you. I'm busy. So um, I, I've tried to expunge that from my vocabulary best I can. But really, more than expunging it from the vocabulary is expunging it from our life. How do, you, how do you become what Peterson called the unbusy pastor? And where you don't write all the way to the margins of the paper and you leave a little time in your life for what Jesus clearly had, which was the interruptions that come without the making them feel like interruptions. Uh, how do you do that? Well, I think, um, I think if I were going back and to pastoral ministry, I would find ways of doing it better than I did. I, I worked at it, I tell you that, I worked at it, but uh, I think it's more important now than I thought then. 
the re reason that is that um, I live a very sane, I think, a very sane life in academia. I wish everybody had this. That I can't. I'm a, I mean, you remember what it's like being in school. Um, and from the time I was five years old till the time I was 35 years old, my life was always divided up this way. And that's from the time I started kindergarten till the time I left teaching at the university. I had there never been a time when I wasn't in school, and so life looked like this, and it, now it looks like this again. Is that middle of August, we hit the ignition, and we work hard, hard for about uh, 10 weeks or so, and then Thanksgiving break comes, and we sit back and get to catch up on some things for a week or so. There's no demands being made. We go back and hit it hard for a couple more weeks, and then we give finals and grade the papers and tie it all up in a bow and set it aside for three weeks and just breathe and enjoy family and don't do anything related to work. And then uh, come January, it's time to crank it up again. If you made mistakes last time, you get to teach the same course over again. You can fix it. You know, you get new faces. They haven't heard those stories before. You start <laughs> all over again. And when it gets to be spring break, you take a break and then you work real hard, finish up finals, t tie it all up. And then you've got a summer in front of you to be creative, to read more, to get ready for the fall and, and all of that. It's a very sane life. Uh, it's hard work when it's going on, but there are these sanity periods is what I think of them as built in along the way. And for 35 years, that's the only way I live. And then for the next 22 years, I lived in this, th this world where nothing ever ends. Uh, it's Sunday, you know, we had a, you remember Tony Campolo's uh, video he did, the sermon he preached, it's, it's Friday but Sunday's coming. Remember that? Oh, we were showing that at our church one time and there was a misprint in the bulletin and it said, the bulletin said, it's Sunday but Sunday's coming. And I thought, that's reality <laughs> for the preacher. Uh, you you get you say amen and walk out of the building and uh, you got another sermon there's another week and very nothing ever wraps up and ends and I, I know that can become an insane way of living I don't have a way of fixing that other than to build in those sanity periods take your days off schedule your vacations don't let them build up uh, the kingdom will run without you or me it's not dependent on us uh, uh, if your church allows sabbaticals, schedule those and take them. If you can just get a week of study sometime, just something to build into the thing, some rest. To quote Peterson again, he um, talks about, he thinks it's significant that in the Old Testament, like in Genesis 1, that the Hebrews measured days beginning in the evening and ending and going. It was evening and it was morning the first day. It was evening and it was morning. And he said, there's a reason for that time uh, pattern is that nighttime is when we are unproductive. I mean, for eight hours a day at least, we should be completely unconscious and totally unproductive. We cannot contribute a thing, which means that's the first part of the day. It was evening, and when we wake up, the day's half got done. God's been working all night long. All we can do, we can't get in front of Him. All we can do is catch up on what God's been at work doing. And there, it's this recognition that the kingdom doesn't depend on us. It was evening and it was morning. Not it was morning and it was evening. Uh, we just wake up to a day where God, who neither sleeps nor slumbers, has been at work all through the evening and we get to step into it. And that kind of mindset of it, the kingdom doesn't depend. I'm not talking about being lazy uh, or slothful. I'm talking about, being, about knowing the meaning of rest, a creator who literally commanded it among the top ten. I mean, we get all bent out of shape, people commit adultery. And we don't care a flip if we don't remember a Sabbath. Uh, but they're in the same list, best I remember. So I would work on that. I, might, I get to work on it a little easier. I got a bit. This is easier. Uh, but I wouldn't, I would work on that, is figuring out ways to live more sanely in the intensity of what is a high calling in a busy place with lots of needs, finding some way to live, live more sanely uh, and really to encourage that with staff as well. Church is very difficult. Mm -hmm. very, very difficult. It's tough. It doesn't matter what size church it is. If it's a smaller church and you're the only staff member, you got your cup is full. If it's a larger church and you got staff members, your cup is full. It does. Yeah, I, somebody was reminding me. Somebody said, "I don't have enough time for that." I said, "He said when I had this other church, I had lots. I had more." I had more time. I don't have time for that. So you got the same number of hours every week that you had back then. Okay, the President of the United States gets 168 hours a week. You get 168 hours a week. What are you gonna do with that? Uh, did but you that's. Take, did you plan your vacations every year and your 
good time without I, interruption? Uh, I try, I planned vacations and I used my vacation. There were some years where I did not and it was not a wise thing to do. And then our church instituted a sabbatical policy where every uh, five years we got some uh, extended time off and I used those. And uh, I really wish it had been there for the whole time, but some churches are, are willing to do that with you. And there, there's actually ways of doing that. You say, well, we don't have the money for that. We couldn't hire somebody to preach while I was gone. The Lilly Foundation has some, there's some grants you can write for and just ask for that and they'll pay the church. And, yeah, we, we can talk about that. But there, I, you know, how you f f solve that is going to be the best you can do. I just say I, that's a thing I'd work yeah, on myself. A fourth thing I think I've learned is um, a little bit more about what price our lay leaders pay to engage in ministry leadership. I mean, we were big on that slide. Uh, we, everybody ought to be involved in a ministry. You know, we've got these externally focused ministries. We've got, we want you to go on mission trips. We want all that. Well, I got to uh, Waco and... Uh, not the church I was a member of, but another church had a Celebrate Recovery ministry on Monday nights. And the leaders in that Celebrate Recovery ministry were, um, they were burned out basically because they had been doing everything much themselves. And I, because I had shared part of our family story in a classroom, uh, one of my students who goes to that church and was part of that ministry said, would you talk to our pastor about and tell your story? Would you come to see our, and, and tell your story? I said, yeah, I'll do that. And then after having done that, he said, our pastor wants to talk to you about this. And so I talked to the pastor at the church, and he said, would you consider giving some sort of interim leadership to celebrate recovery while we try to figure out what we're going to do with it and all that? So starting last um, September, every Monday night from 6.30 to 8.30, I'm going over to the church and going in and setting up and uh, planning the evening and sometimes teaching and sometimes speaking and running a small group and doing that as I'm not a member of the church, but... Same thing, you know, I'm not, this is nothing I'm paid to do, it's nothing I'm required to do. It's a ministry that God's asked me to be involved in there. And uh, with almost without exception, Monday about five o'clock, I don't want to go anywhere. I want to go home and be with my wife and I, I want to go home and watch House or something, you know, and, uh, but it's time to go do the ministry. And having spent a day at work, I go and spend a couple hours at night, and I and I, I just you know it dawned on me really quickly. I've been asking to let people to do that forever. I had really no idea really about, and I'm doing that, and I'm not gonna. I'll be honest with you, but really, this. Let me just put it this way: our lay leaders don't get much uh, in general. Uh, they don't get much pay for what they do in terms of recognition, pat on the back, how's it going, checking up. I mean, there's just those kind of intangibles that would help keep them moving forward with that. Um, the pastor and the staff at the church are very busy with many ministries, and, uh, and I think they probably go, and, and I'm fine with this myself. It just helped me realize it. They probably think, well, Robert doesn't need anything. He's fine. He's done stuff like this before. But I just realized, you know, you kind of, you can get isolated out there doing that. And I, the price our lay leaders pay to engage in ministry, and we need to find some ways to introduce some sanity in what we ask of them as well. Um, they have families and they have jobs, and they're tired at the end of the day. And when we've asked them to come up three times this week to be at committee meetings and involve in this ministry and do that, uh, some, sometimes church can be a little on the insane side in terms of life. So just, you know, you got to figure that out too. Fifth thing that I is I've learned that having a pastor is a good thing. I told you that your time spent preaching is time well spent. The calling you have and what you do with people's lives is incredibly meaningful. And I, and I think I've learned that from two perspectives. One is in saying goodbye to people in whose lives I had invested for 20-something years and, and thinking through um, was involved in that. And the other side is uh, having a pastor. I, and which, you know, I've had a bishop, you know, uh, bishop, bishop Billings and um, Bishop Harrington before that. And, but, <laughs> uh, at, I've had friends, but there's, you know, there, there is, and, and on our staff we had people that we could share fairly intimately with, and we ministered to each other. But it is a, it is a nice thing to uh, go to church and see. We have three pastors. They, they're ones that Josh is the teaching pastor, sort of, but. 
Uh, there are two others they call community pastors, Craig and Toph, and it's really nice to have a pastor. And uh, uh, I had to, some of this first thing I talked about, the community stuff, one day uh, Craig, who was one of our community pastors, was up at the seminary, and I pulled him in my office and said, I need, uh, I need to talk to my pastor. And he said, okay, sit down. We talked about this. Uh, what you, who you are and what you do as pastor is a good thing. And I, I just really affirm that. It's, it's worth your life, and it's worth what you're investing in people. And uh, uh, what we do matters to people. And, and you may not know that it matters to them as much as it does. I've, this, one of the things that struck me is um, I remember playing golf with a friend of ours, a friend of mine one time, and we were out on the golf course out in Clear Lake area. And we run into this, it was just a twosome, and we ran into this guy that was a, my friend knew from work. And my friend introduced me. He said, uh, this is my pastor, Robert. And, I, and after we finished the conversation, I turned to him and said, if I'd been your barber, would you have introduced me as your barber? And he thought, he said, no, I guess not. I, it's a role. You, I mean, you know this. It, it's different. I don't think I could have been anybody else in his life, his doctor, his lawyer, anybody, and he would have introduced me by my name. But um, having a pastor is a good thing, and being a pastor is a good thing. It's a rich thing. People invite you into their lives in ways that, uh, that is holy. And uh, so I, I value it in retrospect, and I really relish uh, working with young people who are following that calling in their life. Um, sixth thing, not entirely unrelated to a previous one. I've been reminded that the most important things about being a pastor can easily get squeezed out of my life and schedule by the demands of the organization. That was a little more difficult to see from the inside about how much of time and energy goes into supporting an organization and reacting to or responding to consumers who call themselves church members. Uh, that just a lot of time goes into keeping an organization running uh, and the, what I would regard as the more important things about being a pastor which are things people will never check up on you about prayer and interacting with scripture and those pastoral conversations of listening to people about the ordinary things in their life and uh, helping them find where God is working in their life those things get squeezed out in favor sometimes of the demands of the organization and if uh, I don't know what the remedy for that entirely is except to be more reflective about what I do I mean to have some time to sit down and think about the day or the week and where did the time go and where was God at work in this and how much uh, for me uh, that's the stuff that would move down the scale toward burnout is uh, an overdose of organization and um, I'm all for the organization Ironically, one of the first classes I had to teach where I got to Truett was church administration. And I thought, well, that's like my least favorite thing to do, but I know a bit, a bit about it. I just don't like it, and, uh, but I know it's necessary. My uh, Haddon Robinson, you know that name? He's a, taught preaching and wrote powerful books about preaching. He had a statement, I guess was original with him, that he said uh, that um, Greek and Hebrew in a sermon are like underwear. They should support, but they shouldn't show. <laughs> well, that's always been my line about church administration, is that when administration starts being the thing that gets all the attention and is visible and all that, it's out of its place. Uh, yeah. You know, you're drooping there a little bit. You need to cover that up and let it support but not show. Mm. So, um, at any rate, finding ways to get the most important things into my life is important, and uh, that's where... It's you know managing time or managing life and making sure the big rocks get in first in our weekly schedule, all those kind of things most of us have heard and known, and then reflecting on uh, where that's going.